Welcome to Spartan Up Podcast. We are your grit and resiliency partner. We rip you off the couch each week, sometimes every day. So make sure you subscribe on YouTube so they hit your inbox while they're fresh and hot. I've got like Sephra. donuts out of the oven, right? Exactly. Joe I got loves those. Sephra Alexandra to my right, co-host, myself, Joe, founder of Spartan, Johnny, Colonel Nye, halo Dr. Jump. L. They're in the middle of a halo jump right now. So we are focused on this guest. His name is Mark Patterson. Yep. Ex-NFL player. Ex-NFL player. 49ers. And Raiders. And Raiders. I mean, killed it. Like, just absolutely nailed it. Said, he eats, what's eats next? shredded steel for breakfast, yeah, this guy. Yeah, at least. Like, shredded Wheaties. And then, and, then, and then he started doing some mountains, right? Well, he did entrepreneurship, nailed it. And then he went for the seven summits. He's six in right now. Six in. And uh, he's just someone who just gets after it. We like him a lot. Well, what's interesting for those listening and those watching, it's pretty hard to pivot. I mean, yeah. you get you get put in a groove, right? You've got that same job, that same relationship, whatever it is. And it feels really comfortable. You're good at it. This guy hung a left, then a right. And he's going up. And he's going down. Yeah. Yep. Nothing is satisfying to him. He wants to squeeze every ounce of life out of life. Yep. Right? That's a, and that's an excellent way to be. So let's listen to his interview and we'll come back and Stay we'll... Stay to the end. Yeah, we'll Stay talk about how you can squeeze the essence out of your life. Make lemonade. Welcome to Spartan Up Podcast. We are here in not so beautiful Lake Tahoe today. Actually, it is beautiful, just not the weather. But it's the World Championship Spartan Race. It's also Spartan World Media Fest, brought to you by ATP Science. Uh, brought to you, we're bringing you Mark Patterson. So, Mark, you, you, some people have a bucket list, and that bucket list might be, I want to be an NFL football player someday. Uh, let's start there, because you've got a lot more on your bucket list than most people do. Yeah, well, first of all, thank you very much for having me here in beautiful Squaw Valley, <laughs> brought to you by ATP Science. Now, yeah. it's... Listen, today, I, I'm a former NFL player, now climbing yeah. the seven summits. I've climbed six of the seven. I've got Mount yeah. Everest coming up. So cool. talk about bucket list and a big goal. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I can tell you, I've been in every single possible crazy weather situation. And I think today, I just came off the 10K Spartan race. Yeah. Uh, and it was crazy. You know, it started with walking out the door with some sun, then some rain, sleet. We got into some heavy snow. Thunder, then lightning, and to cap everything off, I had a bear come right through oh, the trail. Oh, beautiful. Gigantic bear, too. Yeah. I mean, it wasn't like a little baby bear. This thing was big. Wow. Yeah. That's a cool experience. Yeah. So, I, like I said, I've been <laughs> all over the world. I've climbed all these you know, crazy mountains and in intense situations, and to have a gigantic bear come right through your race was pretty intense. Wow. Well, yeah. well welcome back. Yeah, I made it. <laughs> I survived Fantastic. my first, you know, bear. So let, let's start with the NFL, because, I, I mean, I was sort of joking about it, you know, that uh, as if that's just a bucket list thing. That's a huge accomplishment. Yeah. How, how, how did you end up there? Like, what, what was your life story that brought you to the NFL? Yeah, so I grew up in Seattle, Washington, and I think um, as, we, we, as we sit here today trying to climb the seven summits, it's a lot of conversion factors all coming together. Um, very mountainous community, um, big Mount Rainier's up there, 14,500 yeah. feet. But, you know, growing up, I grew up in, in weather like this, rainy and cloudy, and, and I'd go out all the time in a T-shirt and play with the kids, you know, just a total gym rat. And uh, I just kept climbing and climbing and climbing the rung, and it seemed like I, I was really born with a football in my hand. Yep. It came very innate to me. I was pretty good at other sports, but it wasn't natural to me. I mean, I didn't sure. have a great three-point shot or anything. Yeah. Uh, but football was a different story. Uh, I was very fortunate to do well in high school, and that uh, brought a lot of attention around the country and ultimately ended up going to the University of Washington. I went to the biggest high school, which is about two miles from my house, and the University of Washington was about another two miles. So my whole yeah. circle is about six miles altogether. And uh, I went there in a time back in the 80s when the University of Washington, uh, led by Coach Don James, was really cresting and going. And so really what that did, and I think this is metaphorically speaking in life, it really opened me up to kind of thinking big, yep. right? Um, I had never really thought about being on a, uh, a big stage like that. And suddenly um, I was out there playing against US USC, UCLA, Stanford, played in the Rose Bowl twice, played in an Orange Bowl, played against Oklahoma. We were number one multiple times. I was in Sports Illustrated a bunch. Yeah. And um, it just really opened my eyes that I could actually play at that level, number mm -hmm. one. But it took a lot of hard work, and there was no certainty um, when all this started. But ultimately, through years and years and years of really grinding, kind of going through this whole pyramid of success, um, I got there, got my chances, I made the most of those. And then there's a process in terms of going into the NFL. 
and I got invited to combines. Ultimately, I got drafted by the Raiders. And you know, once I got there, it is so hard. It's like an American American Idol, where every week uh, there's a audition, a competition for uh, trying to make the team, and, and then people spot. are coming up and people are being traded, and it's just, ah, am I going to make it or not? And and so somehow or another, I clawed my way to five years. And you know, I'd love to say I retired, which I, I guess I did technically, sure. but really I got thrown out. So sure. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that was it, and I had a great run. But but those five years, I mean, most people never get one year, right? So that, yeah. that's spectacular. Yeah. No, yeah. it's it, it is a. It, I, I look back on it now, and it's, I, I feel great about that. And uh, you know, they they uh, they don't give out uh, pensions um, until you're at least four years vested. Yeah. And so you have to make it to that magic marker. Um, and so proud to be part of the club. So but let, let's go to that because, you know, even though, you know, it's a success and you've, you've got your five years in and you've, you've played in the league, it comes to an end. Yeah. And um, whether it comes to an end after five years or 15 years, I know a lot of uh, athletes have that quarter life crisis because they've played on the biggest stages and they've had the accolades and the attention. And yeah. it's like, wow, what am I going to do now? Yeah. So, uh, so how was that transition? You know, a lot of it is uh, really going off the cliff and what going off that cliff, you know, they do a much better job today of really preparing the athlete for life after football. But at that point in time, it wasn't the case. And so, so it I was had, hard. It was really hard for yeah. me. It was just like, you know, playing in front of a hundred thousand people and catching a touchdown at the last minute yeah. and being on TV and having all those accolades and make that kind of money. And then you go to zero. Yeah. And now I'm like 29, 30 years old. And all my friends who had kind of worked their way up through the ladder, they're kind of up here now. And yeah. I'm back down. And I got to figure out what I'm going to do. And ultimately, I, f I, I started some different businesses. And mm -hmm. I got my kind of the train going after a couple of years. And they turned out to be successful. But um, about eight, nine years ago, uh, I really started running into a wall with my personal relationship with my, my now ex. Mm -hmm. We were married for 24 years. I was with her for 30 and uh, uh, we moved from Seattle down to California. She wanted to resume a career down there, and uh, my dad died of a, a sudden stroke, and it just was a bad time to be me, and mm. just very li very lonely, and it was just like, what was I gonna do? I want, I want to ask you two questions. One is to come right back to that, but the other, just to go back a little bit. You mentioned that you know at first it was very tough, struggling, trying to figure out, and yeah. then you said, then I started a couple of businesses, and you know I think you're, you're, you're humble. You just sort of say, I just started a couple of businesses. A lot of people never accomplish anything in that either, but yeah. What I was going to ask is the skills that it took to become a successful football player. Yeah. Were you able to transfer those over? Is that what ultimately you applied those same skills and that same discipline as far as your business went? Yeah, no, that's a great question. And, and really the key was r really channeling the same energy that I'd always had towards football and rechanneling that towards business of really getting focused on what I want to do to really propel myself and go forward. And what I did is I started this marketing business, and that ultimately led to an import-export business, and that ultimately led to uh, 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 working a lot with some of the big companies that just happened to grow up in Seattle. So Starbucks, yeah. Amazon, Microsoft. Not a bad place to be based. Great spot to be placed. Yeah. I, I actually produced every single green market umbrella that you guys see around the country, around the world, um, you know, outside of Starbucks. Yeah, yeah, you see yeah. those green things. There's a few of them. I produced every <laughs> single one for 14 years. That's you know, great, So yeah. it was amazing. So it was an amazing ride. And then I also started a venture back company. It was a gaming company, yeah. and we sold that company. But um, you know, it's just learning kind of on the ground. Mm -hmm. um, but really having to like put yourself out there, like figure out how you're gonna how you're gonna get that 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 thing done. And so fight for every inch. Fight for every inch. Yeah. Wow. Okay. So now let's go back to the where we where we bookmarked a minute ago. So you know, you fight, 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 succeed at football, start again. Fight, 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 fight succeed at business. And then, like you say, and then all of a sudden you're in a place where it's not great to be you. Yeah. And people sort of, I think people think life can be linear. And I, I, when you speak to a lot of successful people, it's not. There's ups and downs along the way. So let's go to that last down. So now you're, you're, you're saying, wow, I've done all this and here I am still unhappy. Yeah. I mean, boy, it was tough. And, and you know, I think too, sometimes, um, and this is, I think, a real key message from, from my standpoint of, of um, I think um, you got to be really wary of the kind of this shiny object. And sure. just because I was in some high profile things didn't mean my life was all together. Yeah. And, um, and so, uh, it was very humbling, you know, it was, it was, uh, really having, having to figure out. And I think that, that the biggest thing too, there's nothing worse than feeling stuck. And, yeah. and when you're treading water and you're not going forward, at least for me, because I'm a pretty goal-oriented person, and when I'm not going forward, I'm going backwards, you know? And so I just couldn't get that machine, and you know, this the relationship that I wanted to keep going, it just wasn't gonna happen. And it was scary, like, what's gonna happen to my kids and everything else, and, and uh, so ultimately, 
um, I, 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 I kept walking around this block down in Santa Monica with my chocolate lab, and I kept asking this question, how did I get here, right? And I know we've all asked this question, like sometimes you're just sitting there, I'm like, this is impossible, right? This yeah. is no way this can all happen. And sure enough, it was happening. Yeah. And um, and finally, after a couple of years of this, uh, uh, like a, like today, I get you know the thunder, the, the thunder, and, and the lightning go off, and I just decided to stop asking that question because I wasn't going anywhere. Uh, that's a great, great point. Just when you say I was asking that question, and you're asking the wrong question, right? Because all, all you're going to figure question? out is how did I get here? I don't want to be here, so what does it matter? How did I get here? What questions you start asking yourself then? What am I going to do about it? Isn't that great? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Just yeah. to shift that focus? It's total shift. And, and the interesting thing about it is that when that happened, it's like, you know, you can't fly high with negative weight on your back, right? And that was the thing that I had. And I just had to shed that and understand that sometimes things are what they are. And you have to adjust and you have to change and you have to adapt and, and just re-pivot, you know, from the things and the mindset that you've had before to get to a higher place fighting where you are and and asking why am i here well how did i get here and you're resisting it as opposed to saying hey i'm here i'm gonna accept that i'm here now where do i want to go yeah so completely reset that's fantastic i i you know i was like i, I what really brings me joy and happiness is is working out and doing things in the mountains especially and then as i started um i'm from seattle right so um I grew up climbing all kinds of smaller mountains you know things like here in 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 tahoe and um and I knew I couldn't go back and still play in the NFL, of course. And so I, I, I growing up in Seattle, a lot of, of famous mountaineers up there. And so I just always had this fascination with Everest and uh, some of those guys that had done that before. And so I Googled, have any NFL players ever climbed the, the seven summits? And the answer was no. And I said, I'm going to be that guy. Well, and, and that's, gr that's a great thought because it isn't, I mean, athletics isn't um, – mono it's not at all the same right like to be a power lifter isn't the same as being a marathon runner yeah so being an nfl football player takes so much discipline but it's so much specific discipline which yeah. is very different than climbing yeah so uh that that's great that you were able to say that so so w where do you then start so there's a lot of challenges in climbing yeah I mean, there's the, the time most people don't take the time there's the money there's yeah. the there's the um, willingness to fail and go back yeah. you know because not everyone gets up the first time on everyone so yeah. so tell me about that path so you've done six i've done six of the seven so let, let's start with the first one yeah, so uh, good point, too, about, you know, not everybody. Like, for example, I couldn't sw swim. I'm not a great swimmer, so I, c yeah. I wouldn't be good at swimming the English Channel or, yeah. you know, to Cuba or something. You know, I mean, yeah. I would sink. Yeah. So that's not what I want to be. And also most, most um, uh, mountaineers are more like the guys that you see in the Tour de France, which are more the Lance Armstrong's 5'10", 150, 160 pounds. And I'm more like 205, yeah, and I'm sure. much bigger. So I'm yeah. carrying a lot of weight up a mountain, yeah. a lot more than most guys. Um, but um, I didn't know how all those things, the, the, the money, how to get there, what to do. Um, and I said, I don't even care because I was in that place. I just, I'm going to go figure it out like I'd figured out those businesses. Yeah. And so there was a guy, there's a number of um, mountain, mountain outfitting guide groups out of the state of Washington and I knew a couple of these guys, and so I called this guy up. I'll never forget this. I was in the uh, Georgetown Inn in Georgetown and outside of Washington, D.C., yeah. and, um, and I called this guy from the lobby. And I said, this is me, and this is what I want to do, and I don't care what it takes, but I'm going to do it. Yeah. And he goes, great. And, and so he helped, like, diagram this, this vision board of what I needed to do to actually get there. And so we started off with uh, uh, flying down to Africa yeah. and uh, climbing Mount Kilimanjaro. I've actually now done it twice. Yeah. Um, once, of course, my seven, eight years ago, and then again a couple of years ago with uh, Howie Long's son, Chris Long, oh, cool. who yeah, just yeah. won uh, Man of the Year. Yeah, yeah. yeah. so Impressive I was part guy. of the yeah, Waterboy class. It was, yeah, really fulfilling. Yeah. Um, so that's the first mountain I went to. It really tested me at 19,333 feet. Yeah. Um, the next year, uh, went off to uh, Russia, yeah. which is a whole bizarre experience in, in itself. It was playing trains and automobiles down in the Caucasus Mountains. And... Um, and uh, that was more true mountaineering, you yeah. know, glacier, crampons. We got into some weather like today, you yeah. know, thunder, lightning at that height. Um, there's actually, there's a guy that uh, died in, in the party, got struck by lightning. And so it was dealing with, you know, things can start off on a great note yeah. and change very quickly on the mountain. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, next year, I went down to uh, Australia mm -hmm. and I climbed what I call the Fun 7. Sure, it's yeah. called Mount Kosciuszko. Yeah. And uh, it was just a great time to be in Australia and, and hang out with uh, a bunch of Aussies and then go climb this mountain and then come home. And then where things really started to kick in um, was my fourth year down in 
um, uh, Argentina, mm -hmm. uh, South America's highest point is called Aconcagua. Yep. I think you have to actually climb that to be able to say that word. <laughs> but yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's just under 23,000 feet. And uh, the interesting thing is we started with uh, 12 people in our group and only six made it. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, but I felt super strong. We had pretty good weather. And, um, you know, it's really testing with no oxygen tanks to, to climb that, that kind of uh, mm -hmm. altitude. And it just really inspired as I was going. You know, there's a guy named Kyle Menard who I've had on my podcast. And uh, he was climbing up. He's got no arms, no legs. I'm at 21,000 wow. oh, feet. I, I, I do know who he is. Incredible yeah, guy. Yeah, He's yeah. won like two ESPYs. Yeah. And I'm um, sitting there on a rock just, you know, gassed. And, and, and just like, I don't know if I can go any further. And all of a sudden, this, this, this what I thought, I couldn't figure out what was coming up the hill because it was crawling. Yeah, yeah. And he crawls up to my knees. And I'm like, hey. And he goes, hey, dude. And um, yeah. so we, we talk. And, I, and, and so he ends up summiting. Yeah. And then on the other side of the mountain, we end up having a great chat. And just remarkable, and to think again that um, you know six people, healthy people out of our group didn't make it, and this guy with no arms or legs could actually go yeah. to the top, and what he had to overcome. And so I put in perspective, you know, some of my struggles I've been through. And like, you know, I'd rather have my struggles than yeah. his struggle, right? Yeah, it doesn't take anything away from your accomplishments, but it sure um, makes you appreciate them more. It makes you appreciate all the things you have. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right on. So then the next year is where, you know, really started to take a step up and in, in, in um, how, you know, this was going to shape out. And I went up to Alaska, and there's a mountain up there called Denali. Yep. And Denali is a beast. Yep. And it's a beast for the, from the first standpoint of that you're carrying 137 pounds up the mountain. So think about, you know, that I've got Sweet Marion over here. It'd be like carrying her up the mountain. You know? <laughs> so, her and her gear. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so that's right. So, I mean, it's a it's a... It's a, it's a lot of weight, and you're yeah. navigating through all these crevasse fields. You've got avalanches. We probably had six, seven avalanches come yeah. down on us. And um, we got up to 14,000 feet, and there's this lenticular cloud sitting right on the, the cone, the top of the mountain. Um, and uh, it's just bitter cold. It was minus 80 up there. Yeah. And around our camp every night, it was around minus 30. Yeah. And then we got in those heavy snowstorms, and we'd have like 12, 18 inches you know, in six hours. I mean, yeah. like gigantic snowflakes going down. And um, have to dig out and all kinds of stuff. And ultimately, we didn't make it. Yeah. And that's really first time, again, having to pivot and having to adapt and all these things I had to learn, you know, back when I was going through this relationship stuff about Mother Nature also plays a part in all this, yeah. too. Yeah. And I, I'm, I'm guessing that after the, uh, the first three, when it's just like, check, 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 yeah. to get that one, you think, oh, wow, I didn't make it. I got I to gotta do this one again. Yeah. That'd be something. So Mark, interviewing you is interesting, and in one way it's easy because you're such a great storyteller, and, and yet um, you're, you're a humble guy. I mean, you, you kind of you know, just say, oh yeah, I climbed a mountain, and you don't really, uh, it, I, don't, I don't think people understand what a big deal that is. You know, yeah. th these mountains that you're climbing, these are the biggest mountains in the world. When we talk about the seven summits, um, what that means to anyone who doesn't know is it means you're climbing the highest mountain on all seven continents. So this isn't just you know, seven tough mountains. This is literally the highest mountain on every con continent in the world. And so, you know, you've got, th there were three down at this point, yep. right? And, uh, and now you're on this one, like you say, Denali is a beast. It is, it's a monster. Yeah. And, um, and you, you're, you've been set back. So, so when you got set back, like you say, it, it was an, just brutal. Um, where'd that leave you and, and how do you regroup from that? Well, uh, great question. And um, so there's a couple things that really stood out on that particular trip. Um, one is is that you know I can't control Mother Nature. Number yeah. two is um, I, one of the things I've I've come to learn um, in my life, and, and it, it took me all 50 years to figure this out. But my str st my, my my greatest strength is never giving up. My my biggest weakness is never giving yeah, up. Sure. And it, when you're competitive, sometimes you just got to call it and yeah. just like you know, it's just it's just not going to happen. I, I'm, I'm just just going to mention that in, yeah. in in the evolution of this podcast, that's something that Joe's really had to grapple with because he's all about you never give up, you yeah. never give up. And then he's talked to people who've said, Joe, there are times you have to pivot. Yeah, you, you have to, right? Yeah. So so I like to acknowledge your greatest strength is also your greatest weakness. Yeah, and the other thing that was really frustrating that, that I mean, this is where my competitive edge, I've, I've really had to, like, figure this out, and that is is that uh, there's nobody, I mean, nobody who trains harder than me, even mm -hmm. today. I mean, I committed my whole life. I moved to Sun Valley, Idaho. I'm at 6,000 feet. You know, I train. I'm in the mountains every day. And so on that particular trip in 2019, there was a guy um, from Taiwan, and not everybody had trained the way that they should have been trained. Sure. And, you know, preparation meets opportunity. And yep. he didn't train. And he just showed up. And so now we're on this wall. If you can imagine this, 
It's probably minus 30 degrees. We're going up a, a 45 degree wall. It's probably 1,100 feet. And um, we get to the top. I was in the first rope team and we made it fine. And the second rope team took quite a while. And you could see when he was coming over to sit down and, and rehydrate, um, he just was wobbly and he was not feeling yeah. right. And the whole goal was to go up to the top of this rope line and bury a bunch of gear so that we could go back down and then come yeah. up the following day in route to the summit so we weren't carrying as much weight, yeah. right? So as we're going down halfway through, he lays down and he says, I'm done. I mean, he wasn't going another inch. And it was getting uh, late in the afternoon. It was cold. The winds were picking up. We were exposed on this face. There was a huge crevasse that you had to go over. And we're trying to figure out how we're going to get this guy down. And, you know, you get to this point and – and I, and I hate to say this, but this is just the truth. I just want to go cut the rope yeah, yeah. and just let him go down because now you're <laughs> talking about your choices. own life. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, but you can't do that, no. right? I mean, that's, you know, you're not doing that. So um, we it took us about two hours to get this guy down. And now I'm carrying his pack. We're mm-hmm. lifting him over the crevasse. And ultimately, we had to call that trip. Yeah. And uh, it was the right decision to make. And we get down. And so that brought me to the following year, um, last year, 2018. Sure. And so um, I, you know, I trained, I trained, I trained. But when I landed, I was like, oh, here we are again. I've got to go through it. And it was, you know, it was just like hoping to God that the weather was going to, you know, give us clear package, passage to get us to the top. And it was cold. But I went a little bit later in May. Um, there weren't nearly as many um, avalanches, but the crevasses were bigger. Sure. Yeah, and so that just led to I fell in one. It wasn't a big deal, you know. I just I think I fell up to my waist or something. But we had another <laughs> probably good enough to give you a bit of a startle. Yeah, though. I mean it's just like you're walking <laughs> along, like you disappear. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Boom. Um, but we did have a guy fall in one. He we had to pull him out. He's probably 30 feet down. Yeah. And um, but ultimately we did get to the top. We had great weather. Um, not everybody was in tip top shape, but you know. It, we we pulled together as a team and we got to the top and it, it, it was it was great because when I got up there and I wasn't feeling that great on that day but um, it was like thank God I take the top because I never have to come back and do yeah, this sure, <laughs> again because sure, I did yeah. not want to do it yeah so was was that um th- that left only Everest then after that no I so so yeah so now we're on uh, the I, so I have to actually complete and, and take the top so that was my fifth mountain Denali yeah. although I had to do it twice right For sure sure. So in uh, January of 2019 and earlier in this year, I went down to Antarctica. Oh, of course. And that's just uh, Mount Vincent. That's a whole different experience, right? Because there's not like Alaska Airlines who flies in there daily, right? You got to charter a a plane in. And so uh, we did that. This, 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 there's an Aussie group called ALS and they've set up this base camp and you fly into the base camp. And then from there you take a small little plane, you fly literally onto the glacier, like just like you do it in Denali. And, um, you know, that had that was an interesting trip. It was really fun. We had a great group. Um, my tent mate, uh, by the guy, uh, Don Cash, um, he's somebody from Salt Lake City, a good guy. Um, there was a lot of management with him. Um, he, ironically, had been on Denali the year before. I didn't know him at the time. Three days before, he had to be flown off the top, and he lost three fingers and half his nose. Wow. And so they were very concerned about him yeah. um, when we were down in Vincent. And there was, they, they, they brought in a third guy to kind of help manage him. And at the end of the day, um, the, th- the third guy d- had to attend something else, so they made me the third guy. Okay, yeah. And so I had to deal with a lot of that. And, uh, you know, his goal was to shoot off to Everest uh, this last April. And unfortunately, he's still up at 29,000.029. He tagged the top and fell over. Wow. And wow. he didn't make it back. Wow. And so, you know, these things are life and death. Yeah. They're nothing to mess around with. But at the same time, you really got to be truthful with your strengths and your weaknesses. Mm-hmm. And this guy really was more about, you know, showing his friends that he climbed the seven summits yeah. and what a study is because I'm not, I'm not saying anything negative, but yeah. it's just like you're playing with fire yeah. and you got to make sure that you're authentically true to that thing that you're going after. So that brings me to uh, an important question. So like you say, you know, his motivation um, was, I'm, I'm going to do this so I can tell people I did it. Yeah. What's your motivation? What's driving you behind this? Like, what, what's your why in all this? Well, I think my why, at the end of the day, you know, I'm just a born gym rat. Yeah. And, you know, Darcy's over here, my girlfriend, and, and she she's seen this. I mean, you know, uh, like, I'm out here all the time running these mountains. Yeah, sure. There's nobody out there. There's no cameras. We're talking, you yeah. know, the Spartan Up podcast. Thank you. 
Um, <laughs> but we're not doing this when I come off the mountain and, you know, like Mark gets, you know, I, I don't get paid for this, sure, yeah. right? It costs me money to go and put myself yeah. through this, and I, I push myself to the limit. But I just love this whole um, idea of exploring mm -hmm. and the amount of gifts that have come back my way. Again, stepping into the fear for me of what am I going to do? I've, I was secure in this long-term relationship. And then that blows up. My dad's no longer around me who I was close with. Yeah. And are my kids going to still love me and this stuff? So, you know, going to and, – and, and you won't really hear me talk a whole lot about taking the top – Sure. It's really about going to Russia and all the things that happened yeah. in between and down in Vincent and the freezing, you know, minus 40 degree tent with Don Cash and being on Denali and, you know, all these things that happened along the way and the avalanches and the crevasses. It's not really about the tops. It, the I love the process. Yeah, I love the process. And I find serenity and peace for me in the mountains. Yeah. And that's what's helped me really pull out from this bad place I was in. Yeah. Out of it, I've done this podcast called Funny Your Summit, all about people overcoming adversity and finding their way. Going back to guys like Kyle, who've been on my pod. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, again, I'm going to uh, question your humility. Let's go back and actually make sure people know about your podcast. You just want to do the spots. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I yeah, want yeah. you to say it slowly so they can listen to so it. So, Finding Your Summit, all about people <laughs> overcoming adversity and yeah, finding their way. Yeah. yeah, no, thank you for that. Yeah. And, and, and the reason why um, I, I say it's a gift is because just like I was – did an interview today with Chris um, Waddell, and he's the kid that he's the guy who was paralyzed mm -hmm. um, when he was in college. And he's basically saying that his greatest gift for him was the fact that he got injured yeah. from this awful accident that he had because of the gift that he's been able to be crowned by the Dalai Lama, this prestigious thing, yeah. and be one of 25. I mean, it's not about that for him, but it's just about created those opportunities. Created the opportunities. Yeah. So we talk about the challenges along the way. And uh, one thing that seems to me might be a big challenge with Everest, I mean, Everest is a big challenge in and of itself. But when you say that what you love is being out in the mountains and the solitude of it and diving in, it doesn't seem like there's a lot of solitude left on Everest. You know, it's it's uh, it's a huge challenge anyway, but it sounds like it's getting harder and harder just in terms of dealing with the people up there. Yeah, I mean, uh, after this last year was a mess, and mm -hmm. I, I think a lot of people have come to me and, you know, expressed a lot of concern, like, how are you going to make sure you're not get uh, going to have those kind of lines up there? Yeah. And I think the first thing you need to do is really understand why there were lines up there. Mm -hmm. And it was a combination of some different things. It was really the perfect storm. And number one... Um, the the there are two times during the year, one in the spring and one in the fall, where the jet stream that sits at twenty nine thousand oh two nine feet lifts up and it allows you passage up to the top. And usually that window is between ten and fifteen days. Okay. And this year, for whatever reason, that window was about two days. So they're all trying to jam in. They're all trying to jam in, and so then what happened is that there is this big rush to the summit. So you get summit fever, right? Yeah. Because you've been sitting, you've been training, going up and down. Remember, I'm going to land in Kathmandu on, on April, essentially April 1st, and I probably won't come off the mountain until the end of May. Yeah. So when you're out there sleeping uh, in on the ice, on the rocks, you're yeah. cold, you're having bad food, I mean, it's a long way. And you start thinking about hot tubs and, yeah. <laughs> you know, all these yeah. other comforts of life, pizza. And so uh, what happened in that case is that uh, it, it – it, um, there's a, only a two-day window, then everybody rushed to the top, and then it kicked in that all these people who didn't have experience, yeah. like my friend Don Cash, yeah. and then we were tracking him on this Garmin device, and he was 19 hours into it, and you should be up and back within 14 yeah. hours. Yeah. And it was just a disaster you know, for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. So that's what happened. Which I guess part of it, I mean, it's planning. You want to make sure that you've got a plan so you're not in that situation. But second of all, if you're in that situation, it's a willingness to cut bait and say, I'll come back another time if this is what I'm dealing with. Is that? Yeah, yeah. no, for sure. I mean, you know, you've heard this a million times, you know, fail, plan, plan to fail, right? Yeah, exactly. And so, um, w the, so the question is really, the way I look at this is that there's is essentially there's a 4% element of people who um, do not come back, Yeah. right? And so... What I'm focusing on is not the 4%, but the 96% exactly. of the possibilities. Yeah, that's the right question. Yeah. yeah, that's the right question again. Yeah. And so what can I do? I moved to Sun Valley. I'm living at 6,000 feet, so I'm going up to 10,000 feet every day. Yeah. Number two is I train like a mother, right? Yeah. You know, I track all this stuff on Strava, and, you know, already this month I think I've done 220 miles, 230 yeah. miles. Um, I, I, I've really uh, honed my ability to, uh, my nutrition. That's one of the things that's been one of my weak spots. I'm very fortunate to uh, become friends with Laird Hamilton. Cool. Um, yeah. And he's got a this whole Laird Hamilton uh, superfood yeah. group. And so 
um, really understanding my seven summit smoothie that I whip up every morning. You know, it's got spinach and this and that, a bunch of layered product in it, yeah. and protein powder. But it's really preparing that and then stretching and pushing my body, which then I think stretches your mind to another level. Um, today, again, a great example, you know, it was cold. We're running out by the f face of a mountain. Yeah. It, there's thunder, there's lightning, there's sleet, there's snow, there's rain. A, mil a million things that everyone else avoids, like the plague. Yeah. yeah. It's like, are you kidding? You Would you go down? I was, you know, I, I went to the University of Washington. They were playing USC. So yeah. I would have been much better just sitting, you know, in the comfort of my hotel room sure. watching this game. But, you know, when you choose the uncomfortable, then great things can come out of that impossibility. Yeah, yeah and, and lean into it. And lean into it, yes. Yeah. That's fantastic. For sure. Okay, so let's uh, let's jump forward. We've yeah. jumped back before, never going to forward. You've yeah. successfully summited Everett's. Congratulations! Thank you. <laughs> I was looking at the back of your phone case earlier. Hold that up for a second. Yeah. Uh, your friend made this for you, and yeah. it's uh, it has you on six of them, and it has yes. the seventh staring you right in the face there. Yeah, Jim Mora. A lot of people know him from uh, NFL coach and uh, UCLA coach for the last six years. Um, he made that for me when I came off my last moment in Vincent. Very cool. And uh, he's actually going to uh, climb up to base camp with me from Kathmandu. So awesome. that'll be a lot of fun to have him there. All right. So we're going to go a few weeks past that. You've climbed the mountain. We've yeah. got the, the last one filled in. Yeah. What's next? What's next? Well, um, one of the, that's a great question. And, and one of the things people have said, like, once you're done, you know, you're done. I'm like, no, actually, through this whole experience of stepping into the fear and then discovering all these amazing things that have come from it, these people that I've met. I wouldn't be here at Spartan Fest doing these podcasts, starting my own podcast, yeah. unless I would have stepped into all this and around the mountain. So yeah. it all ties in this ecosystem. And so there's a couple things. One, I want to fly down to uh, Papua New Guinea, and there's a mountain called Carson's Pyramid. And there's a debate whether or not um, uh, the South Pacific, which mountain, whether sure. it's Kosciuszko or Carson's. So you're just going to do that as an insurance one. Make uh, sure It's an insurance <laughs> policy that I want to check <laughs> yeah. in. And then the other part is, I, I'm t Doris and I, we're going to uh, like to get a Sprinter van. Yeah. And we're going to go all the way around the U.S. with our main focus is going to Vermont, your hometown, to be Fantastic. on your pod there. Fantastic. Yeah, Marion's, yeah, 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 awesome. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And then um, uh, I want to, I, I didn't realize I'd done this um, uh, after I came off of uh, uh, Denali, but I want to touch the highest point in every state. Cool. So it's really not about, you know, I've already done the hard ones for the yeah. most part. So it's not really about that, but it's really what a great way to see the U.S. I yeah. mean, I've only probably only been to half the states, you know, because you're always going to New York or D.C. or, you know, the, like the core ones, but the center, you know, is like a big hole. In oh, there. yeah, yeah. That's incredible. Um, I, I was reading a while ago um, Dave Barry from Florida. Yeah. He had Tenzing Sherpa's uh, son or something like that visiting Florida, so he had him go to the highest point in Florida, which is a landfill yeah. <laughs> at 390 yeah, feet open or Open the door, <laughs> stick your foot out. <laughs> exactly. Right. So it may not be the most challenging, but there are yeah. the other ones that will be for sure. Yeah, but again, it's really about the journey. I mean, literally yeah. about the journey. You're, you know, jumping the, the sprinter van, you got yeah. the shower out the back, and you got the, the dog, and you're going around, and it's just interacting with all these different people, yeah. and you know, living in the ski town and going to other ski towns, and I, I'm going to send amazing. you. I'm going to send you a link to a movie called 23 Feet, and it's a movie about people who choose to live in sprinter vans and trails and things. Oh, really? For that exact reason. Love that. Yeah, really, really cool. Yeah. Um, and uh, and then th the other thing I want to ask you about is um, so with all these opportunities you've had, and, and you know, along the way, people have helped you, and it's great that you, you acknowledge them. You've said several names of people mm -hmm. who helped you along the way. Yeah. And um, and you mentioned your kids and wanting to to be there for them and things like that. Mm -hmm. So um. Uh, what do you want your legacy to be at the end of the day when you're when you're no longer with us a hundred years from now? What do you want them to say about you? You know, that's uh, that's a great question, and I, I think the answer is it, it is so vitally important to me that that um, number one that my kids always see me like Dad did the right things, yep. um, that I'm a doer, and you know, uh, um, I've had some some people have been very complimentary and like, Oh my God, you've done some cool things. And, and they have been cool, you know, playing in the NFL and the Rose bowl. And I've, I've had some amazing experience and been around some amazing people. Um, and now climbing these seven summits. But when you put that aside and, and that's just, you know, a few things like on one hand, but all the things in the world that you haven't done, mm -hmm. it just opens up possibility. Yeah. And it just drives me nuts when you get to this, this, whatever this 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 i guess manufactured age of 65 or something sure. where we have to retire yeah. and that's just insane to me i will never retire Agreed. i will i will die you will throw dirt in my face working all the way to the very end 100%. and that's just about going after things especially i have two girls and i just want them to know they'll always go after their dreams and never give up fantastic yeah um so when people want to follow you they want to yeah. they want to check in on what you're doing where do they where do they find you yeah please come and check out at mark so my 
Twitter and my Instagram, all that stuff's Mark Patterson NFL. So it's pretty easy to find. P A T T I S O N. P A T T I S O N NFL dot com. Fantastic. Yeah. Thanks, Mark Patterson. Yeah. Appreciate it a lot, Thank man. Thank you, buddy. And I'm looking forward to seeing you on the top of Everest. Yeah, Send me the picture. Wait. Absolutely. I kind of like this level of competition uh, statement. You know, I like I like the idea, that, and we've heard this before. You kind of like it, Joe. I, got, I really like it. I really <laughs> like it because I mean, we've it. interviewed like 300 plus people, right? Yep. And anybody that that's achieved anything great in life has done it because they're around great people. Yep. You played at a level that you're at. So if you hang out with a bunch of duds, you're gonna be a dud, right? I'm watching it with the kids in wrestling. Kids go into a room. And if that room is playing at level one, 10 being the best, they, they end up going down to level one. You go into level 10. You might not be at level 10 right away when you get in that room, but you work your way up. Before you know it, five weeks later, you're on par. I mean, look at you. When we found you. <laughs> I was just scraping ferns off the side of your mountain. Exactly. You were barely surviving. <laughs> yeah, now yeah. you're <laughs> thriving because look at the people you're around. Yeah. Ah. I mean, I think that that's totally true. And you think about... Uh, it's it's amazing to see that once someone reaches a new level, then somehow people around the rest of the world somehow can break those world records too. You know, it's it's kind of this role modeling thing that says, hey, humanity says now this is possible. And each year we see new world records being broken, things going faster, quicker, all these things because the well, human you, performance you need, you, is you, like... You, 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 at the end of the day, the thing that holds you back is your mind. I know yeah, I if, and if you're listening or watching out there and, and you work out every day, Try working out alone and then try working out with somebody next to you. Literally, it 10Xs the workout and nothing has to be discussed about. It, it just happens. Totally. Right? And that's what, I mean, that's so much of the camaraderie. You know, Colonel Nye is not here with us, but so much of what makes the military a successful industry is because they're in it together. And when you're constantly surrounded by people who are pushing themselves, you get farther, you get faster, you get better. And that's, and that's what Spartan does. It says like, hey, surround yourself with a bunch of people and like see what level you can get see up to. See how far you can push. And then keep going. Push to forever. exhaustion. I like this idea, this quarter life. We hear a lot of times about uh, midlife crisis, whatever. You had a quarter life crisis, right? So you're an athlete. You played a particular sport your whole life. You're now 25 years old and it's over. Yeah. I, and he says, you know, how did I get here? How did I get here? And you perseverate on that question till, till he does the paradigm shift and says, wait, wait, wait. Wrong question. Where am I going? Right. I think that happens to a lot of us. Right. How did I end up here? I got this business that's not working. I'm in this relationship that's toxic, whatever it might be. Forget that. Scrap it. The past yeah. is the past. Flip, flip, it. The, flip the question on its head. It right. Happens, it can happen quicker than you think. Where am I going? Where are you going? Where do you want to go? Right. What and else? Did he, what else did he say? Ask the right question. Yeah. It's I like a, that one. Yeah. Ask the right question so that you're prepared to do the work. So it says, OK, so you're not you, you don't like where you're at. So ask a different question. And then to get there, well, you got to do the work when he was preparing to go up the mountains. He's saying sometimes because, you know, we a lot on this podcast, we say push your limits, obstacle immunity, always go after everything, all this stuff. But there has to also be some common sense of like I'm dealing with life and death situations and to not put my team and myself at risk. I need to prepare myself and do the work for the challenge ahead of well, me. Everybody, and anybody that knows me knows I, I, I prescribe to this idea of fire, ready, ready aim. aim, right? So is my brother. And, and, um, and so I think in most cases that applies. But when you're getting, like you said, into a dangerous situation, I love what Ed Vister says, famous American mountain climber. He says, getting to the top is optional. Getting down is mandatory. Yeah. So, so we don't want to be stupid. But I also don't want you stuck in no man's land where you, don't, you never get you never go anywhere. Yeah, you're listening you to saying. podcasts, you're reading books, you're doing analysis paralysis and you don't get going. Yeah. But once you decide to go, once you fire, Commit. then make sure you take the precautions necessary that you actually get down the mountain. Yeah. And I think that's an extremely vital part of it. Right. We all getting we down is vital. Getting down is vital. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And you know what? When we when we talk to all these people, they've accomplished amazing things. Like these are really the stories that are the preeminent, you know, cream of the crop. But at the same time, think about in your own life, what are seven summits that you want to conquer and get up? You know, use these these metaphors and these lessons as analogies and how you can apply it to your life. You know, what are the things that you want to accomplish? Make a map for yourself and, and see how you get there. Prepare, do the work, ask yourself the right questions and Get it done. We, and we want to hear from you. So yeah. tell, tell, tell us, us what, what your seven summits are. We want to know your seven summits. Yeah.